Okay, so <clears throat> welcome everybody, uh, fellows, visitors, uh, colleagues. Thank you for coming. I know it's the beginning of fall break and so it's a bit of a difficult time to get to outside events, but we're grateful that you're here. Our guest speaker today is Lenore Skenazy, and I um, invited her because <clears throat> I hesitatingly waded back into Facebook last year to make a network of friends and that share intellectual interests, and I kept seeing these posts this very interesting person who was putting up all kinds of articles about <laughs> the nature of childhood, the nature of modern culture. And I thought, this person has a real sociological temperament. You know? uh, she's kind of a, a, a sociologist and doesn't necessarily know it, or uh, in any, any case, somebody I really wanted to uh, connect with. And I also was very well aware of some of the issues that she addresses with the nature of childhood in America to my colleague. Kelly Rutherford, who's in our sociology department, who is in fact an expert on childhood in the United States, and has written a book about the, the nature of childhood in the modern world, and teaches a seminar on childhood. Some of you are in that seminar. Uh, so thank you for coming. And she's going to give some uh, comments subsequently to Lenore's uh, presentation. Um, I was purposely asked not to give a very long introduction, so I'm not going to do it. There's a lot more I can say about this very interesting person who is, uh, has all the, the kind of qualities of what I consider to be a liberal thinker, which is the, 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 the most uh, uh, prominent of them is the willingness to challenge convention and what everybody thinks and say what she thinks is true uh, in opposition to what might sometimes be the majority. So I welcome you to Wellesley in that spirit and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Um, something? Aren't I the World. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, that, that, that she is. <laughs> also, she told me to sit down, and I forgot. She's been yeah, so labeled one thing. by her detractors as the world's worst mom. And I said to her at lunch, I said, "Well, I mean, some number of the students here might actually, you know, not agree with that because they think their own mother is that." But I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's nice to be. I, I feel like I can I've trademarked it. But um, anyway, thank you, Tom. So, how could you not come and see the world's worst mom? <laughs> but thank you. I don't know why you're all sitting over here. I feel like I should like drift over this way a little. Um, and it is nice to be called um, a sociologist or anything academic because I went through my own academic career and I actually took a picture as I was coming in. I see I'm in the, it looks like I'm in the art department, frankly. Um, but on the door it said there was American Studies was in here and I was an American Studies major. So I'm like, yay, you know, that yeah, American <laughs> Studies. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck making <laughs> watching my son for a minute, I have to get like enough tuna for Armageddon. 
<laughs> or, or else, you know, barrels of mayonnaise. Uh, and Melissa said, sure, I'll watch it, for a little baby. And that's when she turned to me and said, can you believe she did that? And I'm like, you know, it's easy to forget things at Costco because they're not in their normal pretty boxes. They're in those the cardboard things. She said, no, no, no. I could have taken her baby and she would never have seen him again. And I'm like, that's what you thought was so terrible that the mom did? And this is all, mm-hmm. And she said that everybody else agreed with her that mom was incredibly irresponsible. Why would she do that? I was like, okay, let's just work our way through a little scenario, if you don't mind, of what this would involve for you to take her baby. Um, first of all, uh, Melissa, you would have to be a kidnapper. <laughs> first things first, right? Using the rather slow yield method of waiting for somebody to hand you their baby in public. Um, <laughs> you'd be one of those rare kidnappers with two small children of your own <laughs> already at home, but say you wanted the boy. Okay, let's just give it, uh, let's grant you that. So now all you have to do is, let's see, um, you have to pull the baby out of the cart, right? <laughs> Don't pull me out of the cart. Put him under your arm, and then you have to take your own two-year-old by the hand and have your five-year-old follow you, and then you have to go past everyone else in line, excuse me, excuse me, we're trying to get out here, we gotta go really fast, but please get here, excuse me, excuse me, and you have your two-year-old wailing, wait, I'm supposed to be the baby, why are we taking this other lady's baby? And you have your five-year-old saying, you said we could get goldfish crackers, you we promised we have a pallet of goldfish crackers, and look, we're leaving them now. And it's like, shut up, we gotta go. And then you find the pass, everyone, say goodbye to the cashier. You're, you're, leaving, you're leaving your groceries. You're leaving your place in line at Costco. Okay? <laughs> what kind of crazy person does that? Those are hours, you will never get back. And then you know, finally you get to the door, and I've looked at Wellesley. Wellesley is not the town where this happens. I'm sure there's no Costco within, you know, miles of Wellesley. But if you're in New York City, and you're trying to leave the Costco, there's this person at the door. Right? And they are checking to see what? <laughs> They're checking to see if you've stolen anything. Right? It's like, yes, we're stealing this lady's baby, and I'm supposed to be the baby. Shut up. So finally you get back. It's like, I have nothing here. And it's like, that's strange. Why is she leaving? But without any groceries. So you get to the parking lot, right? And you're a little nervous, flustered. It's your first felony. And you can't remember <laughs> where you parked the car. And finally, there's your car. OK. And then you go there, and you put in the, the two-year-old in the car seat. You put the five-year-old. You get them. The, the, the drinks and the snacks and the books and the movie and the, you know, educational flashcards. And then uh, you don't have a car seat for the baby, right? And, and that's against the law. You would never do anything against the law. So finally, turn off your phone. <laughs> I wonder if I've insulted him. You he left in a huff. Um, so then you put the baby in the car and you make the car seat out of like a... Laundry basket, and you don't know exactly how old he is, so should he still face backwards, or is he allowed to face forward now? And then you have to put pillows around him so he'll be, you know, comfy. And then you have to change the channel because suddenly you have a Bobby Builder fan. And then, uh, then you get in the front and you put on your seatbelt, of course, and just your rear mirror, and you run it across state lines, never to come home again, raising three children under age five now as a as a lady on the lamb. And Melissa thought the other lady was crazy, <laughs> right? She thought the woman was crazy because the woman had left her child in what? Costco. Danger. Costco. <laughs> <laughs> you were listening. Correct. In Costco slash danger. And that's going to be my whole point today is just because you can imagine something horrible happening, um, can we please pull back from that and look at reality instead? Because just because there is a terrible once in a while crime that happens uh, doesn't mean that every time in every situation we should be doing what I call worst first thinking. It's a phrase I hope you will litter your papers with as you write to all these professors. Worst first thinking is coming up with the very worst case scenario first. What if I stole this child and he never came home again and I had to raise him till 18 and send him to college? What, you know, what about the worst case scenario first and proceeding as if it's likely to happen? We believe that that's the only proactive, safe, good way to be. And we punish anybody who is not thinking that way, as I found out 
uh, uh, a few years after that incident, which I will tell you. So first of all, I just wrote a story about that. I wrote a column, I'm a newspaper columnist by trade, and at the time I was working at the New York Daily News, which subsequently, um, I guess that's, they call it laid off. Um, I think of it as fired mate. So remember, if you ever get to New York, what paper should you not read? Pasco. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Never read the Daily News. Tuh. Uh, read the post, which I used to never read because I was so loyal to the day news. <laughs> so, um, so I wrote a column in a certain paper, and I, I thought, wow, this is an interesting moment in our culture where we think that all children are in danger at all times, even from us. And uh, I expected this to sort of set the world on fire because it was such a, a great point. And, um, and I got three emails back. And two were from people saying, like, you sound like America's worst mom to be. Or they were just disdainful. And then I got one from my elderly admirer on Staten Island who would write to me no matter what after every column. And this one was, you're not crazy, but I'm crazy for Skinazy. Um, <laughs> and I assume now he's dead because he stopped writing. Uh, so I think I would care a little more, but no. <laughs> I want better things. What am I on to? So I got, you know, got hired by another paper. And at that time, our nine-year-old started asking my husband and me uh, a strange question, which our older son, who never gets mentioned, um, had not asked me. And the question of the nine-year-old was, would you please take me someplace I've never been before and let me find my own way home on the subway? So my husband and I thought, huh, I don't know, does that make any sense? And we talked about it a little, and then we thought, well, we're on the subways all the time. It's how we get around. They're really crowded, and not just with rats. Um, and I think there's, there's safety in numbers. He speaks the language. He can read a map. He's ready. Let's try it. So one sunny Sunday, I took Izzy, Mrs. Davis, uh, to Bloomingdale's, which shows you where I don't normally shop, because he's never been there. And I said, okay, today's the day. And I, and I said, goodbye, um, with a little more preparation than that. I said, today is the day that I'm leaving you deliberately here. Um, and, and I left him in the handbag department. Um, because eventually you have to leave the handbag department. No, because uh, it's, if you open the door, there's the subway, okay? So I went the other way and presumably he opened the door because uh, I, I've seen him since, let's put it that way. So uh, <laughs> I opened the door, went down in the subway and he, he had a question and he asked one of those, those things you're never supposed to ask, um, a man, that's right. He approached a man and he said, a stranger, a stranger. yes, the worst thing possible. Um, so now I have to consider your old friend or I have to run terrified from this room. So he asked the guy, excuse me, is this the downtown train? And the guy said, oh, perfect for Melissa. <laughs> no, the guy said, you're on the wrong side. Uh, you got to go over there. He went over there um, safely. And he went down a couple of stops and he got out at 34th Street, Miracle on 34th Street. He got out. Um, and then he had to take a bus home and then he got to our house. Uh, safe and sound, and extremely happy, proud. Yeah, he felt like wow, he had done something that he felt he was ready for, and he felt like you know just a sort of a more grown-up person. And with my keen nose for news, honed by 14 years at a certain paper that then dumped me, um, I decided not to write a column about it because it wasn't that big a deal. It was not a publicity stunt. It wasn't even really an experiment. It was just like another step on, in sort of raising my kid. But about a month and a half later, I was at this little newspaper by now, um, and I had nothing to write about. And I said to my editor, I said, should I write about Izzy taking the subway? You know, I, I talked to some other fourth grade moms, and they thought that they were going to wait till their kids were like 38, 39. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yeah, why don't you write about it? It sounds like a nice local story. <laughs> so, so that night the phone rings, and this is my litmus test for any crowd, and it was Joey Boots. Oh, you guys are so classy. Nobody knows Joey Boots. Do you know? You don't know, you don't know Joey Boots. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I would have to call your mom. Right. Joey Boots works with Howard Stern? Yeah, he's like, he's out, he's out there with Howard. I was like, Howard Stern? Joe? It's like, why are you calling me? You know, I'm in my 40s. I'm, I'm married. I'm look at me, you know, why are you calling? When I dance around the pole, it is the first of May, okay? So, well, why are you on the phone? And he said, well, I thought Howard might be interested in your story. I was like, oh, my story, what story? Oh, the, the subway thing, oh, okay. Well, that's nice, hung up the phone. And I thought, well, you know, any publicity is good publicity, except if it's on Howard Stern. <laughs> and then the phone rang again, and this time, it 
was the Today Show. And I'm thinking, hmm, Howard and the Today Show. It's like, it's like I felt Kardashian. <laughs> Who else straddles and I know that's the wrong word. Um, <laughs> both these. <laughs> so, so in the end, Howard didn't have me on the air, which I guess is probably for the best. Um, and I see no death pine without us. Um, but two days after the original column appeared, I was on uh, the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and for contrast, CNN. No, people think of CNN. CNN is really, really bad. Every time they've had me on the air, they put on the mother of a murdered child, and this is true. Sometimes the father. Uh, so no, it wasn't CNN. The contrast to Fox is NPR. Oh. I NPR. And it took me years to figure out what was really going on, because people love having me on, and it's always good, and they get a lot of phone calls. And for the first, I, I really think for the first four years or so, um, I really thought that my crime, in their eyes, was putting my son on subterranean transportation, you know, with the rats and the, the, the John Travolta guy. Um, not really John Travolta. I'm thinking of taking a Pelham 123. But anyways, I thought that my crime was trusting him on subterranean public transportation. But gradually I realized that no, that was my crime. Because there's this one question that I'd say 99% of the interviewers ask me, and they always lower their voice, and they lean in and they say, but more, how would you have felt if you never came home? And I'm always thrown by it, and I always say, like, the equivalent of, like, well, I, you know, I have a spare son at home. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the wrong answer. <laughs> if you're a good parent. If you are not asking yourself, how would I feel if he never came home, if my child never got back from walking to school, from going to the grocery, from playing outside, and the car came by and snatched him, if you're not going to that very worst case scenario first, that is your crime. I didn't realize it at the time. All I knew was that I, I am actually a nervous parent, and yet I wasn't nervous enough. Right? You have to be hysterical now to be a good parent. So I started my blog that weekend after the, after the subway ride, Free Range Kids, to explain that I, I believe in safety. I believe in helmets. I believe in car seats. I believe in seat belts. Um, I, I'm wearing extra layers because I was worried if I'm cold. Yeah, I met Steffi in the bathroom. Should I keep my scarf on? And she's like, no, it's okay. You can take it off, but it's there. And I was like, yes, you're thinking the right way. I can take it off, but it's nearby. I'm always prepared. I think I'm prepared for the worst, but I'm not prepared for the very worst. I'm not prepared for, I, I told my agent, I said, I finally figured out what I wanted my next book to be. I was going to call it um, Quit Imagining Your Kid Dead. <laughs> she, she, she looked like that. She was like, <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> so, but I think that that's, I wanted to explain that I don't think that way. And while I believe in safety, I don't think our children need a security detail every time they leave the house. And that's when I started hearing what's happening around the country that I didn't know because I was living in Manhattan, that parents are driving their kids to the bus stop. I didn't know that. I didn't know that in some neighborhoods, the bus is is considered it's too dangerous, too far between bus stops, so the bus is stopping at each individual house to pick up the kids. You know, kids are like, wow, we have 50 stops, I can't stand it. Um, and, and that's getting to school, that's getting to school, which in my day, perhaps, Tom, this was your day too, it used to be called arrival and dis dismissal. And now it is, what is it? What's it called in the morning? Pick up, oh, drop, drop off, off pick up. and pick up. Drop your kid off, pick them up, because the kids are like FedEx packages, right? We bring them there, that's the only way we can guarantee that they've arrived safely, and then we pick them up and we put them in the van, but not the white van, no, no, that's someone else. Uh, no, you pick them up, you drop them off, and then you pick them up, and then this is what happens, and I bet it's happened at some of your schools, at dismissal or drop or pick up at the end of the, the day. At first I thought this was just in Florida, I thought Florida was crazy, but it turns out it's everywhere. <laughs> Which is that um, about half an hour before the end of school, the cars start lining up around the block. Anybody, I see a lot of nodding, right? Okay. <laughs> not nodding off, you're just nodding. Yeah. 
I nod off often sitting in that line. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay, so then finally, ding, 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 the bell rings, okay? So that means it's the end of the school day. So all the kids are gathered, and then uh, the, the bus kids, the kids who aren't loved, um, <laughs> and then there's the precious children who people care about um, are waiting here. And upstairs in the parking lot or in front of the school, there's, um, I was thinking it's the gym teacher, but there's somebody there with a walkie-talkie. And then the first, you know this too? Wow, okay, did you have the thing in the, the yeah, yeah, so the first car comes up and they see uh, there's a name, there's a placard on the dashboard, and it says, uh, Yona, and so they go, Yona, Yona's mom is here, and down, down the, um, the cafeteria, or the basement, or wherever they stash the <laughs> okay, Yona, Yona, your mom is here, and they take Yona, and they bring her up the stairs, and they walk her across the sidewalk, and they, they shove her in, like, like Obama, <laughs> and then off she goes, and then it's Tom, Tom's mother's here, Kelly, Kelly, your mother's here, Gracie, your mother's here, and it's like, I just, everybody's coming out, and it's like, like, there's, there's bombs exploding, and sniping, and sniping, and ch 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 helicopters whooshing overhead, and it's like, it's like the fall of Saigon. Go, go, get out while you can, get home safely, please. Tomorrow there's a quiz, okay? And, and this is happening around the country in neighborhoods, neighborhoods like this. Neighborhoods that parents moved to why? Because they're safe. And <laughs> well, I actually think those are very twin fears that your child will be killed, you know, raped. It's probably sodomized. Let's, let's put it in there. Sodomized, killed, eaten. Um, or go to a state school. <laughs> uh, they're both such terrifying. Oh my God, that should never happen to my kid. Oh, God forbid. So. <laughs> go off my normal script. Um, so the point being that Wellesley, Weston, um, Wilmette, where I grew up, these are not, did you grow up too? No, I was there over the summer. And I Scary. worked with a lot of kids from there. Yeah. Really? And everybody's picking them up? Yeah. That didn't happen. No idea. In my day, this will show you how old you are. I am. You're really young. <laughs> I'm told that not only did I walk to school, when I walked to school, the crossing guard was another kid. Can you imagine? <laughs> 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 unheard of. You were what? My brother was the crossing guard, and my world fell apart when we were crossing the street, and a car bumped him, and he rolled over, and I said, it was reality anymore. I mean, so, yeah. Wow. And did he survive? Yeah, he was fine. <laughs> My world okay, was he demoted? It was incredible. It's always incredible. I am terrified of cars. Um, in terms of crossing guards, uh, this is just an aside, but um, I married mine. <laughs> I truly married my cross guard, which is what parents always think. They're like, oh no, that's what I'm worried about. It's like, I didn't, he wasn't 35 at the time. <laughs> he was a six, and I didn't marry him then. <laughs> I waited another 25 years or so until I married him. But back then, you trusted kids, you trusted the world, and you trusted your own parenting, you trusted your neighborhood, you trusted reality, and you're not allowed to trust it anymore. So, what's my point? Uh, that we have decided to trust fear and fantastical, dangerous scenarios like, like Jerry Bruckheimer films that we can run in our head instead of like, who are you going to believe, um, me or your own lying eyes? Uh, it's like you're not allowed to trust your own eyes when it comes to your children and their safety. And, and this has sort of corroded or morphed into the zero tolerance laws that we see in America today. I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard the stories about kids who have been suspended, and I can, I can list them. There's a kid who was suspended because he did this. Really scary, right? There was a kid who was suspended when I don't really want to ruin the first page of my speech, but I will. Um, because she did this. That's pretty scary, right? She cut a piece of paper into the shape of an L. She was suspended. There was a kid who had a a, a Lego creature, and the, the Lego kid had the Lego thing. Had, it's not a person. Um, had a gun, which was the size of a quarter, and that kid was suspended. But I think you know the most famous one. Do you know the most famous zero tolerance? incident of the past year? No? Well, I'm going to have you reenact one. I need somebody who's not gluten intolerant. 
somebody who's willing to take a couple of bites of something delicious. Come on up. <laughs> or down, I guess. All right. Ooh. Good for you. Blue Nation. What's Blue Nation? Well, blue. Well, blue. <laughs>
but that today kids are too sensitive, too easily hurt, even by imaginary guns. And so along come the zero tolerance laws and rules and speech codes to, and trigger warnings to protect them from things that they don't need to be protected from, like free speech, troubling literature, or even a statue. <laughs> you guys know the statue I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it was of a gnome? No. Uh, <laughs> so the weird thing about the statue, and by the way, that sign out there is completely wrong. It says, RIP, naked man. First of all, he wasn't alive, <laughs> so he can't be dead. <laughs> Secondly, he wasn't naked. Okay, so these are slight exaggerations, but I did appreciate the, the cute little tombstone. Um, but the weird thing about that statue and the reaction to it was the reaction was as if it was a real person who presented a real threat to the students. And so um, there was a petition to get rid of him, which you probably saw, signed by over 700 students and alumni. And one, I'm just reading a couple of comments from there. One of them said, Wellesley should be a safe place for their students which is already grammatically incorrect. Wellesley should be a safe place for its students, not a triggering one. Okay, as if somehow now the campus wasn't safe. Okay? As if being disturbed was the same as assault. Another person on the petition wrote, quote, a school endorsing the decision to expose its female students to this violates civil rights law. <laughs> and I'm trying to think of what wonderful civil right it was enshrined in the Constitution that anybody anywhere should never have to encounter an idea or a work of art that disturbed them. And if that is the case, if that violates civil rights, <coughs> and you're disturbed by the not really naked, naked man statue out there, what about me? I go to the loo and I see winged victory, there's no head on winged victory. And what if that traumatizes me? It makes me think of decapitation or the wings, makes me remember not getting enough money from the, the tooth fairy. Or I, who is to say what <laughs> triggers a person? And who is to say that being triggered or being disturbed or being upset or having a bad memory is, is something that we must avoid at all costs or the person is literally harmed? So when we start thinking from the, from the Pop-Tart gun to the statue is a continuum where imaginary harm is treated like real harm. And as silly as some of these stories or worries might be, they have total real world consequences when we start deciding that if you can imagine something bad happening, it's as bad as if something did happen. So let me just give you a couple examples. For the summer, the summer I was tracking several stories of moms who were arrested for one mom for letting her kid play in the park unsupervised, and the reason was anything could have happened to the child. One mom for letting her kid walk to a playground, anything could have happened. One mom for letting her kid play up the block, anything could have happened. Um, but the one I want to talk about is a mom who let her kid wait in the car, this was before the summer, this was in the spring, for everybody agrees, five to 10 minutes, in a parking lot, nice New Jersey suburb, kid was asleep the whole time. Everyone agrees the kids slept through this. It was five to 10 minute errand, 18 month old asleep, and the mom was arrested for abuse or neglect, right? And the reason given was something bad could have happened. And the mom said, well, you know, I love my child, and I rationally decided that it made sense to let him sleep in the car. I mean, I, I know this neighborhood, I knew how long it was gonna take, I knew I was gonna come back. It wasn't boiling hot. Uh, I locked the car. I felt that for, I felt realistically this was safe. Not perfectly safe, but waking him up and dragging him across the parking lot is not perfectly safe either. There's no such thing as perfect safety, but this was as safe as could be. And she lost. She lost in court, and she went on to um, the appeals court. And the three judges there, what do you think they decided? She was what? Right. She was right? What did, uh, you're wrong. <laughs> they had to take some kind of safety course. Oh, they always have to take safety courses. It's re-education. Um, <laughs> but no, they, they decided that she was indeed guilty of abuse or neglect. She is now on the New Jersey Child Abuse Registry, so if she ever wanted to be a teacher, 
daycare worker, nurse, volunteer at church or synagogue, can't do it. Um, but the reason they gave was this. We need not list the horribles that could have attended this child. So what those judges were all agreeing, all three of them, and somebody asked if they're all guys, and I don't know. I don't know. Um, and it's going to the Supreme Court in New Jersey, which is very exciting. But because they could imagine horrible things happening, no matter how unlikely, it didn't matter. And of course, they weren't imagining the horrible things if they took them, she took the kid out of the car and got hit by a car, a truck. They didn't imagine what if she went into the store and there was a robbery and, and uh, the kid was shot. All they could imagine is something horrible happening because she wasn't there with him at every second of the day. And so she is on the child abuse registry for not doing worse first thinking, not thinking of the very worst case scenario and acting as if it was really going to happen. So when you have that, then you're not allowed to think rationally anymore. You're not allowed to open your mouth, you might hurt someone. You're not allowed to put up a statue, it might offend somebody. You're not allowed to let your kid play outside, they might get snatched. The, the, if you can imagine a crime, if you can imagine any crime happening, then anyone who lets it happen, who lets the kid be fine, is still as guilty as a criminal, right? The, per the mom has become a criminal because the police could imagine something criminal happening. So we, we have to reject the idea that what if is as legitimate as what is. What is, is legitimate. You're allowed to consult the odds. You're allowed to be rational. But, but, um, but not if we believe that, you're, that that's wrong that coming up with only terrible things is the only good way to parent, the only good way to police. There are laws now that are based on this idea. In, in California, you can't let your child wait in the car for any time, any, any moment, up to age six. Even if you have your 10-year-old watching, your 10-year-old is not old enough to be with a two-year-old or a four-year-old in the car. You have to take them both in because anything could happen. So my point today is that we have to reject this worst first thinking, because otherwise we're all guilty of, of allowing our, our children to live, of going forth, of mentioning bad ideas. Of, this is the part I haven't quite written well, but my point is that there's something weird about a society that throws a kid out of school because of a Pop-Tart gun and sends a letter home as if something bad happened and arrests a mom whose kid waited in the car as if she had put him in the lion then, because a weight in the car is not a danger, and a Pop-Tart is not a gun, and frankly, a trigger is only a trigger if it's on a real gun. And so when you start hearing about all these <coughs> things that you have to worry about, the dangers and the triggers and the be very careful and be politically correct and don't offend anyone and don't hurt anyone, it's all part of the same idea that if anybody's ever offended, they will be hurt forever, and if children are ever scared, they are, work, they are hurt forever, and that everything is out to kill your kids. That's my point. Thank you very much. Extreme individualization and privatization um, 
particularly in, in these cases, the fact that parents are very individually, privately uh, charged with protecting their children and that there's no collective responsibility for children. Um, except for when the state gets involved. So we're also looking at questions about the nature of authority and how authority gets shared between individuals and communities and the state. Um, and we're looking at a kind of um, what has been written about as the therapeutic culture. Yeah, um, that's what I was trying to get to, the idea that you're so hurt <laughs> yes, that you yes, can't yes. recover from a, a traumatic day or idea or right. Hate. <laughs> so if you let me ramble around these ideas a little bit, so one of the things I find particularly concerning about all of this is that in, um, in thinking about children as so vulnerable and needing protection so much, we've effectively um, removed them from public spaces, uh, at least on their own, on their own terms. They have to be accompanied by adults, supervised by adults, which means that we've redefined all public spaces as adult spaces that children don't belong there, which means that when we see children there who aren't obviously under the direct control of some adult, we think of those children as either being threatened mm -hmm. or being threatening. Oh, right. And that's the flip side of all of this, and I'll get back to that a little bit, but, um, but we really have this way of thinking about children as either they're in danger or they are a danger to others. Um, so part of what we're seeing, I think, really is the criminalization of childhood, you know, when chewing your Pop-Tart into a shape of vaguely resembling a gun is grounds for expulsion from school, even if temporary, that's a criminalization of a normal childhood behavior. Um, and it gets worse as children get older, um, particularly as some children get older. But, um, and so what we're, what we're seeing is that children, you know, we've talked a lot, we, we tend to talk a lot about parents and parenting, and I've written about parents and parenting around this, but what we see is that children are not being conceptualized as competent social actors in any of this. They are just there either as uh, objects to be protected um, or as uh, some kind of threat to the public good or public safety. Um, but what we see is that, at the, you know, as, as I look historically at the development of this, at the same time that children's public freedoms have been curtailed in these ways, uh, we've seen other kinds of changes in the level of competence, the kind of behavior that's expected from children in private or protected spaces. Uh, so we hold children to much higher standards of emotional competence mm -hmm. now than we ever have. We expect them to be able to express and talk about feelings, that is, to recognize their feelings, to name their feelings, to talk intelligently about their feelings, and to anticipate with empathy the feelings of other people. Right. This is a very therapeutic project. Um, it requires the aid of counselors. <laughs> um, and these are kinds of self-expression that were not really expected of young children in the past, but we're expecting them of younger and younger and younger children now. Before kids can talk, there are charts, viewing charts of little cartoon characters with expressions on their faces that you can take your child to the wall and have them point out how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and um, some, some of these kinds of emotional self-expression and also verbal uh, self-expression are very, um, especially encouraged in a middle class style of parenting that Annette LaRoe is called concerted cultivation. Um, at the same time that having kindergartners walk to school unaccompanied has become utterly unthinkable in America, we're holding those kindergartners to higher and higher academic standards once they're in the classroom. Um, so I think that these increased um, emotional and academic expectations are tied in some, uh, in some complex ways to the expectations and demands of especially middle class and professional work in a post-industrial knowledge economy. Um, that, and, and what all of this means is that we've, we've begun, I think it indicates that there's a shift in how we conceptualize the, the self and personhood. That we have increasingly conceptualized what it means to be an autonomous individual in these therapeutic terms of self-expression and self-creation um, to the diminished, giving a diminished attention to uh, what I might want to think of as more um, 
on civic forms of participation, that is a public site. Um, if you'll permit me, I haven't really thought this through, but I, I think there's something, I mean, I've just been sort of musing uh, in the back of my head for, for a day or two on this. There's something a little bit weird to me about a, a culture in which the most eminent arbiters of the law in the land have trouble defining personhood in a way that makes sense to the people living, and so they say a corporation is a person. Why? Because it has an opinion. So I don't know. There's something very there's something very therapeutic to me about the the ruling in Citizens United, uh, and to me, there's some kind of, maybe there's a connection there between how we think about children and what they're capable of and what they're competent at, and what that indicates about how we think about what it means to be a social actor um, and what that consists of, it consists of having um, closely held feelings, perhaps. Um, so, um, so I think this is a bigger, I think there's a bigger kind of cultural shift that undergirds a lot of these kinds of um, instances. I, I also, it, it rambling a little bit now, but I think it's quite fascinating that so much of this turns out, so much of this fear around children turns out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, because once you do worst first thinking, um, so often in my uh, you know personal life, talking with other parents, I have young children, interviewing parents for my research, so much of the worst case scenario thinking of what could happen, the worst that could happen is somebody will call the police and you get arrested. <laughs> Not that there's an actual danger but that the danger is that you might be charged with endangerment. That that's the worst thing that people can imagine happening in many scenarios is that uh, someone's going to call Child Protective Services because they don't think that parents are doing an adequate job of uh, supervising their children. Uh, so, let me see. I, one last thing, and then I want to just uh, have a chance for some conversation and questions. <coughs> I just want to say, to the extent that we focus all of this attention on parental choices, you know, choose to leave your kid in the car, choose to let them walk to school alone, um, you know, choose to feed them pop tarts instead of um, organic yeah. tofu, <laughs> right? Um, I think that when we focus a lot of our attention on these parental choices, we are not thinking sociologically, and we're not thinking about parenting contexts. And I want us to begin thinking a lot more about parenting contexts and the contexts in which children live. Um, and part of the reason for this is that there are dangerous neighborhoods. There are places that children are in, real, not imagined, right, 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 right. danger. And by holding parents individually solely responsible for ensuring children's safety and by making poster cases of these ridiculous scenarios that, that Lenore is documenting, um, we're diverting attention away from any kind of a public demand that we have a collective responsibility for ensuring children's safety in all contexts. Uh, and so I think that when we pay so much attention uh, and we're over-focused on the remote but possible risks to middle-class children, um, we're not paying attention to the actual dangers and risks of violent neighborhoods, of hunger and malnutrition, of the lack of affordable housing, of um, you know, underfunded public schools where zero-tolerance policies mean that those schools become a pipeline to prison. Um, and so these are the things I think we should be paying more attention to rather than some mother in suburban New Jersey wanted to let her eight year old, her 18 month old finish their nap. You know, finish napping. Because if you've ever spent a day with an 18 year old, <laughs> happen to have a 21 month old at home, that nap by herself is. <laughs> She's not alone right now, but <laughs> that nap is really important to the child's well-being. And to the mom. It's to the mom's mind. sanity. To go for convenience. convenience to the mom's mom sanity, but to the child's well-being as they go through the day. Um, so when we privatize these issues and we 
say it's all about parental choices, and parents need to make better choices, right? So children need to make good choices, and parents need to make, see it's all about choices, right? That's that therapeutic ethos. It's all about your individual choices. And I think as sociologists, as sociological thinkers, we have to be constantly drawing attention back to social context. That we really need to think about social context. Um, wouldn't we rather create safe childhood contexts rather than focus on parents' choices? Um, because it's not just that all of this is happening because parents sometime around the time that you all were born, woke up one day and decided to be overprotective. Right, I never blame the individual parent because it's so obviously something that is going on in the entire culture. Yes, I, but I, I, so I, I, many people do. <laughs> so many people do, including, uh, you know, including state authorities are willing really to blame individual parents. And so um, I think that we have to constantly be asking what are the social and institutional arrangements um, and cultural norms that are constraining how parents are able to do the work of parenting, that are constraining how children are able to be in the world um, and to be viewed as people too or not. Um, because until we begin to change the context, we're just um, treating symptoms little, little and, yeah. and not actually getting at being at the, really, the cause of this leadership. I don't think, but I think there are children who are both much more vulnerable than we think they are, and a lot of children who are a lot less vulnerable than we think they are. Um, your son riding the subway was a lot less vulnerable um, that, than a lot of people thought they were, that he was. Mm -hmm. um, but by having his story told in multiple media outlets, mm -hmm. we were not paying attention to actual vulnerabilities oh, yeah. that require, I mean, wouldn't we rather spend our public energies on no, 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 those no. things? Wouldn't we rather spend our energy on regular people than celebrities? No, I mean, we're always drawn to yeah. the wacky cases or the cases where you can say, I would never do that. Yeah, so I think this is, you know, some of the things that, as I think about what, why is it this way, I, I have to search for um, answers that are, you know, broader than just individual cases and ask what's tying them all together. Right, and what we're, what we're not paying attention to in the case I wanted to add one other thing when we're talking about getting down on parents for their individual choices, women's college, or women. Um, it feels to me that this desire to save children from the dangers of waiting in the car for five minutes or from walking to school, what does that mean? That means that generally it's the mom is going to be the one who has to take the kid out of the car, take the triplets out of the car, and you know, and get them back into their snowsuits and drag them across the parking lot and buy the Tylenol and then drag them back in, and suddenly that's half an hour gone, and plus you know all of your um, will to live. And um, and it means that you have to be at home because they're going to be at home and they're in danger if they're not with them. And you have to, if you want them to have any outdoor time, you can't send them down the street to the park. You have to be with them. And I think of it as a back door against. Right? Because we're not saying you're not allowed to work and lean in and have that great career. We're just saying your child is in danger, ma'am, and I have to arrest you because you let the kid wait in the car for three minutes. So if you're wondering, you know, it's just another angle on this whole issue. It's, it's you, you call it parental choice, but if it's enforced by all the social norms and then by the cops that you're not allowed to let your kid do anything without you, that means you either have to hire somebody or a bunch no of somebody. There's no choice. Um, and and so when you hear for the good of the children, try and figure out what's really going on. Because the children have been doing these things since the beginning of time, playing in the park, going by themselves to the fishing hole, uh, perhaps making ports or whatever Tom was telling me about. Ask him sometime in sociology, give him a few drinks and ask him how he spent <laughs> his childhood. I mean, these are things that kids were allowed to do on their own and they generally remember them pretty fondly and they felt like it allowed them to grow up and it allowed the mom to have a separate life. But now you have to be completely entwined with your kid or you're not um, giving them enough teachable moments or you're putting them in literal danger because they're waiting in the car and God knows what could happen. The cops say something bad could have happened. So there's, there's more to child safety than just keeping kids safe. That's what I would say. Perhaps we yeah.
there's, yeah, there's some down. very basic statistics that yeah. apply to some of this, and one of them has to do, it's about 20 years old now, I think, in this formulation, Joel Best in a book. Oh, I love Joel Best. Threatened yeah. children. Yeah. That stranger kidnappings maybe constitute yeah. less than a percent of yeah. oh, abductions. Far less, far less than. Uh, the, the this, is, this was back then. I, I mean, I haven't kept up with the numbers, but what, what I have. What's interesting sociologically about that is that it speaks to a simultaneous decline in informal norms where an adult may participate in the observance and, uh, or uh, observation and even reprimanding yeah. of a stranger child because that child's doing something they're not supposed to be doing. Yeah, you have to be completely hands off if you're so, a stranger. So this is this is my uh, constant conversation with my colleague, my critique of, the, of a certain aspect of the pathology of libertarian thinking, which is that, and, and it comes out of feminism as well, that the uh, uh, liberal feminism, radical feminism is a little different than that regard, but liberal feminism has put the burden even more on women without them simultaneously demanding that some kind of informal norms be brought back into play. Wait, 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 wait I'm getting so confused. Give me an example. I already said. <laughs> right? Because I'm not a sociologist. No. Uh, tell, uh, just talk to me. Just tell me, like, what happened bad that we have to change? And then I'll think about it. <laughs> what, what, what hap well, it's not that it happens bad. It, what happens <laughs> is that there's a, a, a different way of thinking about responsibility. To because of the way in which the culture has been affected by who, what counts as negligence and who's responsible for that negligence. And what happens, I think, over time is that people who would otherwise intervene feel only competent to re refer what they see as problems to official authorities right. rather than taking any responsibility right. themselves because if they do, they might be accused of child molesting. But it's not even that. I mean, I, I know what you're or saying. Or they would just have to be responsible. Right. No, they have to be responsible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're talking about, God forbid, like if a man said, oh, don't cross the street, and he held the kid back, and he said, get your hands off my child, your child molested. But there's there's a bunch of women who are calling 911 now, too, if they yeah. see a child alone. And it's not because they're afraid that they'll be accused of child molesting or being a predator because they're a woman. I think it's because we really think, I mean, I'm with you in that we believe now that to be a good Samaritan is to notice any time something bad could happen, once again, to get to meet the worst first thing. All these moms who are arrested. If you see something, say something. If, which I think is the craziest thing. I, if I tell you how many backpacks my kids have forgotten on the subway, I mean, like, we would just be in a constant state of red alert if every bag they left on the subway was, was being called in to the cops. But, 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 but the parent, but you see a child in a car, you've been told. If you see a, car, a child in a car, call 911. You could be saving a life. And so you think you're being this good Samaritan. You think you're being, you know, God's gift to that child. You've saved them from roasting, even though the mother's coming out saying, I was just returning the car. It's like, well, anything could have happened. I'm still calling 911. So I agree that, that men might be afraid <coughs> to help children in any situation for fear of being mistaken for a predator. But it's not just men. It's everyone thinks that children are in constant danger, and the only way to save them is by getting the state involved, by calling 911. But it's also it's also an extreme privatization of the family. So it's it's sort of the the end result taken way to the extreme of there are many different kinds of families, there are many different ways of doing family, and uh, the people who live around me in my community don't have the right to tell me how my family needs to be organized. Um, you know, like like it has to be composed of a man who works and a woman who stays home with children. Right? That we have all these choices, and that's the triumph uh, yeah. of feminism, but taken to the extreme, it means that there's no sense of community norms around family at all, uh, that, I, that I can't take responsibility not only for you know, telling my neighbor how they should live, but for watching my neighbor's child if I think that they're about to chase a ball into the yard. Or cut their damn lawn. Yeah, so so it's so there's a sense of um, there's a sense of real um, isolation and, and distrust that can grow up in the absence of some sense that there are community norms uh, for how to have children in families and what to do with them. If it's only the family's sole responsibility, um, then other people are hesitant to step in, not just because they're afraid they might be 
uh, held you know, liable for something bad that happens, but because they feel it's really not their right to say. And uh, this, all this talk about economic inequality, that, that's not what is really animating the anxieties in this culture. It's moral inequality. It's the inability for people to judge what other people do as right and wrong. And that is a pathology of libertarians. But it's through reference to the authorities, which is kind of ironic. Right, because I feel like everyone is judging and saying, she shouldn't have let her kid go outside. And I don't see feminism as the as the evil here. I mean, the way well, I am not suggesting it was an evil, it has an unintended consequence of, of which... Uh, but I don't see it as coming, I mean, like, there's so the many different um, strands that are feeding into this fear. I mean, you have a, a media that's, you know, ubiquitous and, and loves showing you the worst case scenarios. You have a marketplace that can make money. Anytime you make a parent afraid, you can sell them a product to assuage the fear. There's, you know, the monitors and the GPSs and the, you know, BPA-free bottles. It's so there's going to get better. <laughs> that's good to hear. But it's kind of an unintended consequence of that freeing from community constraints, which we're yeah. free from, but then if there are no community norms, then we can't appeal to community norms for what's common sense. Right, right? and also there's I do no feel that there norms. is... There's no sense of common sense. But there is a common norm, which is that any child on their own in public is in danger. That's what you started off by yeah. talking about. So there is this common um, idea of what the norm is. A child should always be accompanied by a parent, and I'm trying to change it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a student professor. Yeah, I was just gonna, what, I, what I would love to hear from the students in the room, they're even younger than my two daughters, I'd love to hear from them how they feel about being raised in the way that you were I don't, describing. Were you raised? I don't even know that. Were you raised? I'm sorry, not were you raised, period. Um, <laughs> were you raised by um, parents who felt like you couldn't do anything on your own? Interestingly, with my parents, so it, well, I spent you know I spent the summer. I was working in I was working actually for at Northwestern summer camp. I was interning in Chicago and working for Northwestern summer camp. It was really interesting to see the difference between how these children were raised and how I was raised. Um, and you know we're only like 15 years apart, and they were you know out mostly in element you know elementary school kind of secondary up. You know a lot of these parents you know the the lunch has to be a certain way. You know children you know children. You have to do everything like very supervised. Very, you know, children. There's no unstructured time anymore. Right. That was the thing that I was like, I was sad as to them is they don't really have any unstructured time. They have to constantly be told exactly what they have to do at all times. It's a, it's such a it's a way of I think just totally having no belief in the kid that unless things are done perfectly, you're either wasted a teachable moment. Or um, you put them in danger, or they're going to have some terrible reaction to this, or they're going to be bullied, or hurt, or disappointed, or whatever. And it's it's that vulnerability thing again. It's like if you think that your children are um, can't handle a different kind of lunch or swapping for a, an apple, then you have to watch everything they do. And then that's also goes. Not only are you discounting the kids as being completely vulnerable and unable to roll with any punches that humanity has rolled with for a million years, but it's also it's more of this this burden on the mom again. You know, you didn't make the lunch perfectly and you forgot to include a note that said I love you with a clever riddle and plus the SAT word of the day. You know, really, there was a site, there's a site online that tells you how to write a letter to your kid at camp and it also gives you the SAT word that you can put at the top. So you're not just showing them you love them, you're pushing them, you know, you're going to help them by getting better SAT scores. So there's, it's all together. It's like pushing the moms and distrusting the kids and really making life much more complicated, less free, and less fun. Mm -hmm. She's gonna call on me. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll call on you. I'm gonna take the student first, and then I'll get to you. Okay. <laughs> Going back to the idea of lunches, um, <laughs> I just wanna uh, give you an example. So my mom would buy the ingredients, and I would have to make my own lunch and pack it, and that would be fine. But my brother, who's four years younger than me, isn't doing the same thing. My mom's not only buying the ingredients, but also making the sandwich. Is it a boy or? Yes. Ooh. Um, <laughs> oh, that's so. Yeah. I just, I'll I, succeed if you want. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. To do exactly. Right. I feel like right. my mom is almost pressured into doing.
doing that for my brother. Mm-hmm. Because you don't have a younger do sister, sister, do you? No, <laughs> I don't. Fun. No. It's just the two. Go okay. get um, just going off of that, I am four years younger than my sister, and the same thing happened. So it might not be the girl-boy thing. It might be the baby in the house that they don't want to let go of. <laughs> that, was the same. that was what it was in, in, in my case. I got lunches through senior year of high school. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I appreciate your talk. Um, part of what you were saying, it seemed to me that it was restricted to a particular group, maybe mainly middle income individuals. And so I think that's part because they have the resources and the ideology to impose these, res- these restrictions. But I'm wondering, when we consider lower income um, backgrounds, they usually do have those levels of community and this type of community raising, in part because of obligations to work and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering what's your opinion on those different groups outside of this norm that you talked about. I can tell you, when I saw it, I always go back to my own experience, which is that my kids' grammar school was everybody mixed together. And um, what I felt terrible about, I mean, I felt terrible about everything, but, and I still do, but um, it felt like even um, the children of, you know, moms who didn't have much money, sometimes single moms, were expected to be supervised at all times. I mean, I just felt like this, this middle class norm of intensive parenting and fear for them in uh, any time unsupervised or on their own, it felt, maybe it was Manhattan, but it felt ubiquitous no matter what um, income the people were. I think it does, um, I think it places additional burdens um, where the resources are stretched mm-hmm. thinner and thinner to provide that level of supervision that may be uh, widely expected. And the other thing, um, if you're in my class and we already covered this this week. The other thing I think I see it um, potentially doing, that kind of uh, consequence it might have, is that to the extent that we allow our uh, cultural notion of childhood to be dominated by an image of children as in need of constant protection, it creates a situation where um, when the resources don't allow for that level of constant protection for children, we have a cognitive dissonance about those individuals as children because they're not sufficiently protected to have our image of childhood. And so it creates a, a, a real um, inequality in which children are deemed worthy of, of society's attention as children and which ones are symbolically exempted from childhood. I also have to tell you that when I talked to um, a friend who used to work at Court TV, um, she said that the story they're always looking for is a middle class white girl who's been kidnapped. Those are the ones that sell. I just want to throw in something because I, um, there's so much in all of this that needs to be <laughs> interpreted at many different levels. But the thing that really strikes me is what what Kelly said about the parents not being so worried about some actual offense against their children, but other parents or other people, you know, using this thing. This thing has a lot to do with, you know, to call and, you know, and put people under surveillance and call people so that essentially what you describe is exactly what people like Hannah Arendt and other people described about the quality of totalitarian systems where everyday people were reporting on every, everybody else and that's what kept this totalitarian system in place. I mean, I, I really am very uh, cautious about using the word totalitarian, but on the other hand, what's really disturbing me in all of this is how it looks on the ground, how it feels. I, I have some experience with parenting and remember being just constantly as a sociologist vexed by all of this. Because I was always looking and interpreting what was happening to these vulnerable little bodies. You know, when they're getting, as you say, brought from the school, put in the car, you know, so that there's absolutely no room for play or movement of that body, or in a temporal sense. And, you know, when you talk about this stuff, it's only gotten worse, it seems to me. And what you describe is, in some ways, almost a totalitarian situation. For the kid. You know, for the kid, <laughs> but also for the parents, because everybody's locked in a system of surveillance and possible offense. Mm-hmm. And the kids are completely regimented. What you described in terms of time and structure and control of the body, 
That's what happens in what sociologists call total institutions. You know, like the army and boot camp. That's when your body and your time is completely regimented. And, I, you know, I just, you know, I'm morally outraged by this. I'm, I'm morally outraged by the fact that the state has had so much, has gotten so much power for some cop to determine whether you're a good parent or not. That really frightens me. And the fact that they can make up something right. that could have happened once right. in a million, that you're, trillion. You're guilty of a crime because of what could have happened. Because the I mean, cop can imagine something. A bad. crime happens when someone is a victim. Not what could have happened. Right. A crime happens when right. there's a victim. That's one quaint old idea about <laughs> what the law is. But I'll, I'll stop after this. But the point I, I wanted to make, too, is that I don't know how to roll it back. You know? I mean. Oh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, please tell us how, because I, once these things settle down in the culture like that, I don't know how you can kind of be the one that shows up and says, just let my kid walk to the car, or I'll be in the parking lot, or I'm going to leave him in the car, because you, you're just becoming a criminal. You know, right, the state Supreme Court New Jersey case, is coming up, is yeah. it, is, does it have the potential to be an unprecedented kind of ruling that... Oh, I don't know, I mean, I'm assuming I mean, so, I don't think it was case, I don't think it similar case has reached any other states. That's what I, that's what I mean. So yeah. there, there, there's a likelihood of a much greater attention. Yeah, no, I hope it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And yeah. they say, like, look at this kid was not in danger. We can't just put people, yeah, we yeah. can't put people on a child abuse registry for not abusing their children, for believing in the overwhelming odds that the child is going to be fine. I, the case that disturbed me equally this summer was um, a mom who had a newborn and she had to run into the store. So the newborn just leaving the car. Somebody sees the kid in the car, runs in and says, there's a child in the car. And the mom says, oh, that's mine. And she's waiting to check out. And so the guy knows that the mom is checking out and obviously soon to be at the car. And he calls 911 nonetheless. And that's one of the reasons I think phones are um, part of the problem because it's so very easy to call 911. And also once 911 is alerted, cops I think are by law um, required to then um, shove it down the left line to the Child Protective Services. So not only did, she was gone by the, she was four minutes, everybody thinks it was four minutes, she was home by the time the cops came to her, you know, they got the, the license plate, which she had snapped and sent in. So they came to see her, but what killed me is not even the Child Protective Services people who always come, it's the paramedics came to invest, to examine the child. And that is completely hallucinatory, that, that four minutes in a car equals a true danger. I mean, we all know we've all been in a traffic jam for four minutes. We've all waited while your, son, your friend went and got her coat and came back and not died in those four minutes. All of reality tells you that that was a safe situation. And yet the, the, the apparatus or the apparatchiks are proceeding as if it was truly a crime, which reminds me of the statute not being a rapist. I mean, there's something about the idea that if you have a fantasy of danger, it's the same as real danger. And when that is given the weight of law, then no one is safe because you could say, why did I put all these people in there? What if there was a fire and they couldn't all get out the exit soon enough, you know, off with her head? Um, as a historian, I want to go back. And I'm guessing from what you're suggesting about your ages, and it's just accelerating, is we're going back to the 90s probably? That's what you suggested. And so what I'm thinking, and that's why I said the thing about getting into Harvard, and I do think they're related. So what I'm thinking is that you have an economic crisis in which we, for a variety of reasons, no longer see ourselves as having, you know, a, an assured top place in the global economy. So we've got globalization. And what you also got is changes in, in who's going to college. And so middle class parents no longer feel that just by being rich, you can pay for your kid to go to college. So your kid is not guaranteed, if you've got money, to get in to Wall Street. So what, how all of this and the economy is going on, you get economic problems are going on at the same time. And then you have US news and world. Yeah. <laughs> so the media of ranking which right. colleges count and whether you've been a successful and whether you've been a successful not. parent mm -hmm. is now ranked by whether you got your kid into US News or where on the US News and World Report. So all that's a rubric. 
So all of those things come together, I'm guessing, sometime in the early 90s. And they all dovetail to create the situation in which parental concerns about what is essentially status and being able to assure status for your children evaporates. And so what parents then become is terrifying. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to be able to pass on to their next generation of children what, you know, what they have. And then you get the privatization. Because then we're going to buy every service possible mm -hmm. to be able to guarantee their kid does get into law school. I think it's less of the fear of their kid. I think it's more that parents want to give everything to their kids. Mm -hmm. Like for my neighborhood, it's um, a pretty well off neighborhood. I'm not one of them, but there's like a, a, an elite group within this neighborhood, and they send their kids off to SAT prep when they're in middle school. You know, they give them all these resources, all these extracurriculars since like they're in elementary school and make sure their schedules are packed. I don't think it's so much like they're concerned about their safety, but more of just like they want them to go to these elite schools. They want the best for these kids. They want to enrich their lives. Yeah, yeah. so that's why they're scheduling out so much. You're describing status anxiety, yes. but status anxiety often comes out in very bizarre, weird ways projected onto other things. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. And I also think there's a pushback, though. Like, I don't think this is a t total, you know, statement about all parts of society, because I also think their parents who look at the other parents who control their kids' lives and say, you guys are weird. Mm -hmm. You're creating a weird kid who's gonna have problems with being therapy when you grow up. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, that is a total um, reality as well. And to say, um, and there's also kind of a stigma of being an overprotective parent. Like, yes, there are a lot of overprotective parents, mm -hmm. but you can't seem overprotective. And if you're kind of going too far with it, then other parents think that's absurd. And also I think, you know, talking about the college thing, you know, I come from a town where most kids go to state schools. And it's, it, you said that like premium on getting to a really good school just kind of, I mean, it's there, like you, you need to go to college. But I don't know, I think it's just interesting. I don't think it's a blanket statement to say that all parents want their kids to go to Ivy's yeah. and that yeah. all parents are on top of their kids 24 seven. Um, just, I, don't know, I, think where that, I think where that line of thought though might be useful is in asking, is in trying to answer the question, why are uh, affluent parents, um, upper middle class parents, affluent parents suddenly feeling as vulnerable and anxious about um, somebody calling DSS as uh, poor parents, uh, parents in communities of color have been all along. Yeah, that 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 um, that level of middle class scrutiny toward immigrant children and immigrant parents that has been there for centuries, or toward um, less affluent parents, um, that level of scrutiny has been there all along. Why all of a sudden are affluent parents feeling subjected to that same kind of anxiety? Yes, um, I think I've learned that. I I come from a community. The fear is real. Um, oh, my yeah. parents, they are overprotective in a different sense. And the, it, paradoxically enough, they are very overprotective, but I've gained more, un, like, quote unquote, freedom than a lot of um, students because I had to. Right. Because they didn't have the resources. By myself right. When I was nine, because I had to do things like that. Yeah. So it's really interesting. And this is definitely, like, very socioeconomically like, because the things that you're telling me, I'm just like, I don't understand. Because my school is not like that. The community was not like that. I never experienced any type of teleconferencing in that sense. <laughs> Pace is different. We have a magnet program where some students are like that, but the majority of where I lived and the people whom I interacted with, I didn't understand that type of protectiveness. Because the protectiveness, that, the protectiveness that parents feel as immigrant parents are more due to the lack of um, the ability to conversate with people, the ability to understand what's going on in the social and, um, and justice portion of our economy, because they don't understand what's going on. And for my parents, the fear was that people could call them for basically doing anything because they had no idea what constituted exactly right and what is not. Yeah, exactly. And if, and if we don't know what the shared norms are, then everyone starts to feel that way. Yeah. If we're not sure what we can get uh, slapped on the wrist for. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you guys find that there's a correlation between the age of parents and between anxiety? Because like I, my parents are, my parents are like older, a little bit older, so they kind of grew up at like the tail, kind of like the tail end of the 50s, early 60s. So 
Did they, a lot of the kind of like helicopter parenting norms, they were just kind of like, oh, that's like, that's for so I young I wonder if that's why I'm yeah. not, I'm older too, and I just think like, I, I think there might be some connection to that. And also what I hear is that the next generation, like the generation that's just having, starting to have kids now, which is like a little older than you, might be swinging back a little, you know, either in reaction to their parents being so crazy or just because, you know, they just have a more laissez-faire attitude towards everything because nobody's going to have any job. Why should they work? <laughs> so many parents like once the kid comes home happy from going to the park by himself or by making her own play date or by just walking around the block and coming back and saying oh I just met a squirrel or whatever <laughs> the parents are so excited to see just a tiny fraction of their own childhood and their kid being happy that it really broke the fear and then like a week later the you know the kids are walking to school and they're you know they're riding their bikes it, it really broke the fear but the thing that was important is that the school endorsed it and if a school that you yeah. trust, that especially is this tippy top school in Silicon Valley where all the tech titans are sending their kids where the PTA gets $3.2 million a year. Um, if, if your school that is devoted to your child's education and development and grooming them um, says, grooming them is probably a long word, um, getting them prepared, the, school, the school's imprimatur is what's going to help change things. So that's one of the things. Isn't somebody here from like teaches about education? Yeah, I, I would like to spread this to to the to the schooling world because I think that the counter revolution can come from the kids wanting to do this, the teachers saying it's great, and then the parents witnessing it for themselves and the fears slipping away. It's coming up through the early childhood world and the, the, the uh, preserving, re reviving play mode, adventure right. play yeah. around, so right. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. So it's it's coming up from from the bottom there, right. but the sort of K-12 schools are still very embedded in this totalitarian mindset. One thing that both of you, I think, have omitted is the tremendous degree of resentment and frustration in the parents mm -hmm. as a consequence of their own behavior. And I think, too, the eagerness on the part of many parents to find opportunities to be disengaged from the children who exercise such control <laughs> over them. Uh, I drive to school every day or take walks around the neighborhood and I see the moms in the playground on their cell phones while the kids are doing nothing. That might be a wonderful thing, but uh, 
You can imagine there's someone else saying, wouldn't it be better if the mom actually wasn't having their child? Over the weekend, I had dinner with my older daughter, and I was surprised there were two families sitting at a table near us, and three children, uh, two little ones, maybe second, third grade, and then an older one, maybe sixth, seventh grade. They all had iPads. The kids were on their iPads, so the parents could possibly have some time to themselves. So I don't know if I'm making much sense, but I think that there's a lot of, of, uh, of, of sort of unhappiness among the parents at the spectacle that they're making of themselves in their obsess <laughs> obsessive surveillance. And uh, 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 what, what do you think? You say they don't like the parents they become. They don't like the parents they become. And they're not at all convinced that they're, in fact, working to their children's own uh, Right, vintage. that's why you got it. So if you let them do something like the free range kids project and then the kids start walking to school and they realize they don't have to hold their hand there all day long and yeah. drop them off, it's, it's freeing for both generations. Yeah. And like I was saying before, it's especially freeing for moms because moms are the ones to whom all this intensive cultivation and supervision has usually usually shoved on them. And so you can free your kids and free yourself and free your career and free your other interests if you just go back to trusting the world, trusting what is, and not this horrible what if scenario that's, that is constantly presented as a real fear. No, we, we have, we can break at six. We have a fancy dinner coming upstairs. Ooh, for everyone? For, for everybody here that wants to come. Oh, no. um, yeah, oh, no. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.